Ethereum client teams are currently testing the merge upgrade on public testnet. We feel it is important to learn about EL and CL clients readiness so you will be able to run nodes of your favorite client and be part of Ethereum proof of stake network soon. Welcome to Peepenny episode 72. I am Pooja Ranjan and with me is a very special guest and the project manager of Hyper Laser Basin Sazita. Thank you for joining us. Thanks Pooja. Thanks for having me today. Hyperledger Besu is an execution layer client of Ethereum blockchain designed to be enterprise friendly for both public and private permission network. It can also be used on a test network such as Robston Gorley and I suppose Sipolia too. We'll get to know more about it uh, in this episode with uh, Sazida. So yes, I'm here to talk about Besu and the merge actually. Um, so just a quick recap for uh, the people listening. Um, the merge is going to be a transition from proof of work to proof of stake of the Ethereum network. Um, we'll have the two different chain merging into uh, what we call Ethereum 2, but that will just be Ethereum mainnet in the future. So the proof of work chain and the beacon chain. Uh, the merge will happen when we hit uh, the terminal total difficulty that will be set. And the consensus logic is going to happen on the consensus layer. So currently the proof of work client that we know today will stop mining and become basically execution engine. Um, so today, I guess I'm going to talk a bit about what we can expect from the merge um, timeline as well, and an overview of Bezu, what uh, it does currently, what it's going to be doing post-merge, um, some of the challenges around testing the merge, but also tooling and resources that people can use to test the merge, right? Uh, and also what's on the horizon for Bezu in terms of opportunities and how to contribute to the development, uh, whether by running a node or contributing directly to the code. So quick intro. Um, I'm Sajid Azwari. I'm an engineer uh, from France. I'm uh, also, I, I have a background in research, several years of experience in telecommunication. Uh, defense and healthcare. I actually discovered Bitcoin and Ethereum at the same time in 2015, and I've been fully engaged in this space uh, since. I launched and worked on several projects related to data privacy and cryptography in distributed systems, such as Hellhound, which is a decentralized blind computation platform uh, that I co-founded with Amira Bouguera, which is a, a cryptographer who's a cryptographer, and we have also launched a DEFCON for Escape Room that was pretty fun. And if people want to know more, you can just click on these links. Um, I'm currently the tech product lead for Bezu, uh, and we have approximately 17 engineers at Consensus and several contributors from other organizations. So why is the merge important? What can we expect from the merge exactly? Uh, the merge is not here to solve some of the issues that we know uh, and that people talk a lot about regarding Ethereum uh, on the scalability side or the gas fees that are very high. It's just the next step in the natural evolution of the protocol. So if you're looking for uh, the merge to impact uh, gas fees, that is going to be a disappointment. Um, for scalabilities, uh, it's better to look at other types of uh, evolutions around sharding, vertical trees, and in parallel and probably sooner layer two solutions such as rollups. But what we can expect from the merge that is pretty neat uh, is better energy efficiency with a 99.95% reduction in the network's carbon footprint. And that is going to be the biggest drop uh, in history in terms of carbon footprint overnight. Uh, it's also interesting to see that uh, the, mo the modularity introduced by the merge, uh, separating the execution layer, which is uh, intensive from a computation standpoint, uh, from the consensus layer is going to also allow for better optimization in the future. Uh, ultrasound money already uh, you know, introduced by EIP 1559, but now we've staked it and the locked uh, supply, it's going to be even more interesting in terms of uh, just crypto economics and supply constraints. Um, I think, yeah, I think we can also mention that the fact that we're able to do this uh, in a seamless manner uh, with little friction for developers uh, and app runners is pretty nice. Um, we've been testing this since the launch of the Beacon Chain 
and there will be uh, no API changes required uh, for dApps, uh, wallets, uh, DEXs, and, and other types of actors. Currently, we have almost 400,000 validators running on the Beacon chain. Uh, and I think those are unprecedented numbers. Uh, and so maybe something that I was thinking about a lot is that decentralization and scalability at the same time can be hard to reach. But the singular path that Ethereum had starting as a proof of work chain and then changing to a proof of stake chain um, has enabled for a better distribution of tokens from the beginning. So uh, at least uh, in terms of token distribution, we have something that is very interesting from a decentralization standpoint. And uh, for scalability, uh, we'll see uh, what's next on the roadmap. So talking about roadmap, uh, here is a timeline uh, of the merge. Uh, I have been very careful not to specify any dates. Um, so I think uh, we are using the community not to get too attached to, to dates. So uh, I really liked Superfee's uh, step-by-step presentation of the timeline here uh, because it's more about the logic of how we will get to the merge as a community. Um, so first, and this is coming pretty soon, the eruption testnet fork uh, is going to happen. We're going to fork the other testnets as well. Uh, so that's going to happen on the proof of work uh, side, but also on the proof of authority side. And then the consensus layer is going to prepare for the merge as well. And then the merge ultimately will happen. When that will be, I have no idea, but hopefully not too far from now. So. Talking about this next important milestone, I don't really know when this video is going to be released. So it might be after we, uh, we go through the Bellatrix upgrade. Uh, but uh, yeah, so there is a new beacon chain that was created just for Robston. Uh, so that's pretty nice. Uh, that means that we're gonna be able to test the merge uh, for the first time on a testnet that has been around for years now. Uh, this reminds me a lot of uh, the excitement that we had during the Infra Interrupt Week. Uh, it was the first time as a community that we went from a proof of work to a proof of stake uh, transition. Uh, it was pretty cool. It was also um, interesting to see how much we were able to uh, accomplish in a week, probably uh, months worth of work. Um, so yeah, pretty excited to see what's going to happen on Robston and if everything goes smoothly, uh, we just keep up uh, with the timeline I just shared before. Um, it's a good opportunity for testers to uh, actually go through the merge and see how things look like for their dApps and services in the post-merge world. So I really encourage people to participate to this one and the next ones. So about Bezu, um, Puja, you uh, did a good introduction of, of the clients. Um, Hyperledger Bezu is part of the Hyperledger project that was uh, actually founded by the Linux Foundation in 2015. It counts many blockchain technology, Bezu being one of them, uh, but Bezu is the main Ethereum project of the foundation. Uh, so Bezu specificity is that it's a fully mainnet compatible client, but it's also enterprise friendly. So historically we've supported lots of features. Uh, a lot of them have nothing to do with mainnet, uh, like private uh, transactions, um, some consensus engines that uh, are not proof of work. Uh, but it's interesting because it puts Bezu in an interesting spot, meaning that if uh, everything converged to mainnet, which is what I truly believe in terms of innovation and what's coming up uh, in the future, um, it's easier for those enterprises to switch uh, to mainnet uh, using Bezu because they've already familiarized themselves with the infrastructure. So I think there is an opportuni opportunity here to use Bezu as a, a ramp towards mainnet for enterprises because, uh, and I'll talk about this later, uh, the future is really on mainnet, not on private or permission networks. So the six systems that you can find in Bezu as a client, and they are common to other clients actually, uh, are here. So the EVM engine is just a virtual stack that is embedded uh, in each Ethereum full nodes. Um, it's responsible for executing the bytecode, which is uh, just higher level languages like Solidity compiled. Uh, and uh, this is where we deploy uh, and execute smart contracts. Consensus protocols can vary. I've uh, named a few and, and wrote about uh, some here. 
uh, but basically it's a set of rules that validators follows to uh, decide what is valid or not. Since there is no centralized authority to decide who is right and who is wrong, uh, nodes need to agree on the state of the network. So it's really uh, a method to review and confirm what data to add to the record. Peer-to-peer -peer communication is pretty standard. It's just nodes talking to each others. JSON RPC communication is pretty, pretty interesting. Uh, I've mentioned it a bit before, but it's basically what DAP needs to uh, leverage on-chain data. So if you have to query on-chain data, you will go through these APIs. And this is what uh, DEX is uh, or wallets uses. So uh, it's very important. The data storage is mainly trees in blockchain, uh, specifically uh, Merkle Patricia trees. Um, and for busy, we use uh, Rocks DB. Uh, actually, I'll talk a bit more about storage with Bonsai in a couple of slides. Uh, so pretty cool improvement that we have. Um, I don't think I need to go through block production, <laughs> first because it's mining, second because I think most people know how it works. But yeah, basically you bash some transaction from the mempool. Uh, you you know generate a certificate, propagate it to other peers. People just check if everything is valid. If so, it's added uh, to the blockchain. Uh, so those are historically the main systems of what we know as uh, an Ethereum uh, client uh, functions today. But in the future, in the near future, uh, we will have a, a change. So. Post-merge, uh, as you can see on this slide, on the left side, you have what we know as Ethereum client today uh, with a mining system in this monolith. Uh, and then post-merge, you can see two different modules. Uh, the one is the consensus layer client, uh, and the second one is the execution layer client. Uh, you can see here that the mining has been dropped and it's really the consensus, that, the consensus layer client that is driving uh, the blockchain forward. So how, yeah, how do they communicate? Uh, just let's zoom in here a bit uh, between the consensus layer and the execution layer. There is some new piece of technology, very important, that is called the engine API. Uh, I just, I circled it in red on the slide. Uh, that's basically uh, structuring the interaction between the two layers. And so what will remain as a responsibility or responsibilities for the execution layer is basically maintaining the state of the network. So we talked about it, uh, the state tree and historical blocks as well, uh, providing access to that state to new nodes joining the network and looking to sync, um, storing transactions, distributing them to peers, but most importantly, preparing and returning uh, the payloads to the consensus layer and executing such payloads. Uh, and the last point uh, is providing an API for the consensus layer clients and JSON RPC API end endpoints. And so, for example, that's what uh, MetaMask uh, is going to use or other dApps. Uh, it's also interesting to note that uh, there is an authentication now that's going to happen between the EL and the CL through a JSON web token. And so that has been put in place and will be uh, tested. It actually, you can already test it on Kiln uh, testnet. So, so that's, that's pretty neat. Banzai. So I mentioned Banzai a bit before. Uh, the very good news is that it's now available for general use. We were able to remove the experimental flag uh, some time ago now. Um, it's a pretty big change of paradigm regarding state storage um, for Bezu. Uh, basically, we were so basically the strategy was a forest of trees, so what we called forest mode. And we had the uh, underlying data uh, store mirror uh, the Merkle tree data structure, which is not super efficient because each node in the tree was saved as a key value store by hash. And with each new block, the world state was updated with new leaf nodes and new state root, but the old leaves and nodes would remain in their underlying data store. And so as the state was growing, uh, the issues were uh, that traversing the tree structures just became very slow and the footprint on disk was growing a lot. Um, so the good thing with Banzai is that it address these challenges through implicit pruning and flat storage. So simply put, um, when there is a change that is made to the, to the blockchain, the tree log layer keeps only the differences in state. And so the, what we mean by implicit pruning is that since we are not storing everything as we go, 
um, the footprint is just lighter. But you can always reconstruct the data that you need uh, using the diff. So if I'm comparing, for example, get to Bezu, uh, get strategy around snapshot is to take a fixed point in time, and then with the diff log, you reconstruct uh, current values. But with a, be uh, a bonsai approach with Bezu, you're going to uh, start with the current point in time and then use the diff log to construct historical values. So it's very interesting if you're looking at um, uh, using data around the head. Uh, but if you want to reproduce historical states, uh, bonsai is definitely not the best strategy. But for stakers, it's interesting because it, it means less state growth and easier maintenance uh, of the staking infrastructure over time. So as you can see on the diagram here, uh, we were pretty happy with the result and the improvement it, it brought to the, to the users. And something else we have coming that is still in the testing phase, but I just wanted to mention it, is SnapSync. So uh, it's an implementation of the Snap protocol. So basically, you can download the entire Ethereum state without having to download all the intermediary, uh, intermediate Merkle proofs. You can just regenerate them locally. And so that will reduce the networking a lot, the networking load. Um, Bezu is going to be able to sync the world state much faster. Uh, in the latest test that we have, even though it's still very preliminary, we went from more than 24 hours uh, to less than six hours and even three hours on some machines. Uh, on uh, Mac M1 for a full download of the main of the main network state. So that's we're looking at a 85 percent reduction. So yeah, stay tuned for the blog post uh, and confirmation of all this <laughs> nice data. So testing the merge, uh, it's important, I think, for people uh, to understand the risks uh, to get motivated to test the merge. Uh, I feel like uh, a lot of the community is relying on the core devs to do that, but it's actually a, a collective effort. And I, I was just stressing in this article I wrote for the devs behind the merge series um, using this image of you know, the airplane engine that we need to change while flying. Um, currently, there is uh, a lot of assets uh, stored uh, in DeFi alone uh, on Ethereum, uh, plus the eat staked on the beacon chain that number is a bit big now due to the recent crypto market conditions but uh, you get an idea and more than 500 uh, thousand daily active users worldwide on ethereum so that's basically most of the emerging web3 uh, industry that is supported by ethereum at the moment so not only is it a risk for ethereum users and enterprise and actors it's also a risk for the whole blockchain and web3 industry um, so it's important that everybody everyone contributes to and we need all uh, a pair of eyes on this uh, and just echoing Belton's tweet here um, this is an existential risk what we're doing right now is a major engineering challenge uh, specifically uh, something that i was looking at is client diversity so uh, Supermajority of a client is bad, and we know that because uh, obviously, if you have a supermajority, if there is an issue with that client, it's going to affect all the network. Um, we are seeing here better numbers from the consensus layer, uh, so that's that's pretty cool. That means that the campaign that was sort of launched to have better uh, diversity uh, is working on the consensus layer, but on the execution layer, we're still far ahead. Uh, actually, Dunk had uh, did a very nice article where he runs through different uh, scenarios of uh, what would happen if an execution client that has this amount of uh, network shares has an issue. Uh, so yeah, a bit dystopic, but uh, that's probably the type of, of things that we need to realize uh, how urgent this matter is. And not only do we need diversity at the client level, but uh, also at the language level, uh, most of Smart contracts today are written in Solidity, 90%. Uh, Viper is, is still a minority language. Uh, and so it's, it's just important to have diversity at every level uh, to reach um, global resiliency. So testing the merge, I said I was going to share some uh, tools. So here you can find some interesting links 
from uh, Marius, uh, but also Pari. They did, a, if I'm not mistaken, a video with you as well a uh, while ago where they go into details. So I'm, I'm not going to uh, spend too much time on this. Uh, but just to go back to why testing is critical, um, it's impossible to eliminate all risks around the merge, but we can mitigate a lot of that uh, by understanding that we're dealing with complex systems. Um, we do not have a deterministic model of uh, what we are uh, working with, so anything could go wrong. There is a lot of inputs, obviously, uh, and variety of outputs, so you cannot really predict uh, how one thing is going to impact another. So that's also why I like uh, testing strategy around fuzzing, because you just, just try to make up uh, the most random scenarios and see if something is going to break. Um, and it's also important to understand that uh, it will never be the same uh, if a small number of people test it than if we have a large number of people because we all think in different ways and something might be obvious for some people that is not obvious for other people. And so just by increasing the number of testers, we increase the space, the testing space and all the scenarios that, that we could test. So it's a reason why it's really important to for everybody to start uh, doing more testing. So uh, in this slide, I actually put uh, a list and the mega merge resources that Mario Havel did, and it has uh, all the links to uh, tools, uh, launch pads that people can, you know, go through and join the test nets, uh, start testing, and you can also find some scenarios that you can uh, try at home. I compiled in the merge testing leaderboard some interesting data. It's usually fresh um, because of how the page is set up. So you can go there to have the latest information on the merge uh, testing calls. You can also view who is testing uh, currently or not. And that is also an incentive for people to just be more proactive uh, in the merge testing, especially uh, dApps. So to echo what Tim said here, um, protocol layer testing is not application level testing. Everything that uh, I've mentioned basically are things that people can do and they don't have to be uh, core devs or, uh, you know, protocol uh, software engineer or whatever. Uh, you can go ahead and just make some transaction, deploy a DAP or smart contracts and just start trying some stuff. Um, yeah, I guess this is this is well put. Uh, client teams and DEF can't single-handedly replace QA for all Ethereum projects. So it's up to the community to also uh, start participating in this. So what's on the horizon for Bezu, especially uh, post-merge? So basically, uh, modularization has been a big topic for us. Uh, as I mentioned in the beginning, monolithic client infrastructure is how we've been doing things for a while, uh, especially because we were catering to a wide variety of users from enterprises to mainnet. Uh, that has led to a lot of, of depth and complexity with a uh, large set of features. But it makes less and less sense now, especially because we're going for modularization at all level. We're seeing that with the merge itself, uh, but also the operation of new roles around block production that is going to be externalized or can be externalized and does not have to uh, happen in uh, in the client. So the merge in itself is pushing us to think of modularizing Bezu. Um, it's going to be easier on the maintenance and it's going to allow also uh, more people to contribute. Uh, as I mentioned before, I do not believe that the future is going to be on the private and permission side. Uh, and either way, like the gap is just growing. So everything that is meaningful or interesting that has happened on Ethereum lately has not impacted the enterprise side. Enterprise, they don't care about EIP 1559. They don't care about gas fee optimization because they don't pay gas. Uh, they don't care about the merge. So um, yeah, I, I think we're, we're looking at uh, a convergence to mainnet from uh, all sectors of the industry. And so the other reason is that, uh, as I mentioned, we want more contributors, uh, especially outside of consensus, but in general, we want more people to contribute to uh, Bezu. And that is just way easier when someone that wants to 
uh, add a feature or improve something in a part of the code base does not have to actually understand the whole code base. And when you have a monolith, the problem is uh, you're trying to change something here, but you actually have to go and find out why it's dependent from something way further. Uh, and so if someone needs to go through that learning curve of going through <laughs> almost the whole code base just to make a small change, it's not going to be uh, motivating. So we have a lot of friction at the moment and we believe that modular rising can really improve uh, the contribution experience. Um, and as I mentioned, unlocking opportunities, uh, I mentioned here MEV uh, because it's a great example, uh, but uh, I could mention actually the EVM extraction that uh, was done by uh, Dano Ferrand, so uh, one great contributor that we have on Hyperledger Bezu that is uh, not at consensus. So that's a perfect example of how big of an impact you can have uh, on a project, uh, of, on an open source project. He extracted the EVM. Uh, as a standalone library, and that has unlocked many opportunities. Uh, it's now being reused in other projects. It can also be re reused by Rollup Solution that wants uh, an EVM. Um, so, so yeah, so there is a lot. Uh, there is a lot that can be done. Uh, so, new roles and business models. I, I touched on that. Uh, I guess uh, new tech that will leverage Ethereum protocol as layer one premium settlement layer. Yeah. So, what I mean by that is. Um, we're, we've been looking at things uh, currently uh, based on the status quo, but post-merge, new roles are going to appear. And what we, what we would expect today Ethereum to do um, is going to be done by other technologies that, have, that are being developed at the moment or that we maybe don't know uh, what they are. And so people, so there is a lot of space for people that want to discover, invent, and contribute um, to the roadmap here. Uh, and I just think that's pretty exciting and that should bring more people to core developments, hopefully. Um, it, I just think it's great to come to a project and understand that not everything has been done or decided yet from a technical standpoint, and you can still impact the architecture uh, and the decision from a technical standpoint. So that's the message here. Um, and so, yeah, linked to that, open innovation is going to grow. Uh, there was uh, the client incentive program that was launched by DEF, which was amazing and uh, unheard of. Um, there is the protocol guild also that is assembling and trying to find a way to, um, to reward uh, core development work. Uh, it's just interesting because I think we've understood now that a lot of the industry is based on protocol and core developments, yet it's the place where we sometimes struggle the most to um, find revenue streams that make sense. So if you look at how much you can make in DeFi or in MEV, uh, running a searcher, uh, sandwiching people, it can be a bit depressing when you're a core dev <laughs> implementing the IP, making sure all that work for everyone and, and you know, just having a salary, which is great, you know, like it's, you have a job, that's, that's fine. But yeah, I think um, it's important to not let that gap grow uh, too wide. So Hyperledger Bezu is a minority client, and this is why it's important to run it. And it's also interesting co to contribute to it because we do not have the same pressure as GET. I'm just going to say it. Uh, kudos to the GET team, honestly. Uh, but that also means that we have um, maybe more space sometimes to try stuff, uh, even if uh, uh, the trade-off with stability uh, is in favor of uh, innovation or testing some experimental things. And so that's a very interesting learning uh, space. Um, the other thing is just linked to what I said earlier about client diversity. We need to uh, encourage minority clients. We need to, to keep uh, working on them. The Hyperledger Bezu uh, community is, is actually pretty strong. I, I put here some numbers just for people to, to show because it might not be evident from, uh, from what there is online. And we have been seeing a, an increase in contributor participation. Uh, the code base is, is huge. There is a lot of engineering challenges, modularization being one of them. Uh, we've been talking a lot and getting inspired by Aragon and they've been very uh, open 
about uh, modularization. And so there's, there's just a lot of challenges that uh, I think some students or uh, people in software looking to uh, maybe change their job or contribute part-time to an open source project might find interesting. Um, so how to contribute is pretty easy. You just join the servers on Discord. Uh, we actually have two servers. Uh, there is the Hyperledger uh, server. And so you just go and find us on the Bizu channels. Uh, and there is the consensus server, same thing. Uh, I'm also very um, hopeful that we can leverage the uh, incentive program from the EF. Uh, as a way to fuel community participation because uh, the EAT uh, that has been uh, gifted is also a way to generate more rewards. And so there is a way here to actually kickstart something new, a sustainable uh, business model for open source software uh, that can just fund the development team, fund uh, bounties program. And so one thing that I was really interested in is creating a Bezu bounty program for people to just come and start contributing um, on. So stay tuned for that. We'll see if we can if we can kickstart that in the next couple of months. And yeah, so if you are interested in all of these topics, um, testing the merge being one of them, I put the direct link here to the basically a Twitter feed that is going to uh, send you on the latest news regarding testing the merge. You can obviously read it to news by uh, Ben Edgington. Um, you can join the merge community call uh, if you want. Those are public. Uh, if you're looking to try the merge on testnet on Robsten, uh, the latest Bezu release uh, is supporting uh, this uh, Robsten TTD. Uh, so you can just click here and, and, and download it. Um, I'll be at HCC in July. So for those of you who will be there, I'll, I guess I'll see you. And uh, yeah, if you need to reach out to me, uh, my DMs are open on Twitter and you can reach out with Telegram or email. And uh, that's it for me. Thanks again for having me. Thank you so much for sharing all this information. This presentation was quite informative and I'm sure it's going to help many node operator to know their client. Sharing about Bonsai and SnapSync was really cool. Like the Bonsai is, is a really cool feature that is coming up. Because this is merge special, um, I have a few more questions related to it. Those are mostly related to your experience, maybe as a client developer and even for client uh, manager. Uh, so if it is fine, we can probably go ahead with a couple of questions. Sure. So um, I know this merge is one of the biggest change that is coming up on the Ethereum blockchain, yet it has just a couple of proposals, like two EIPs for execution layer clients to be integrated. Uh, I wonder uh, what would you consider the client integration and deafness testing experience here? Is it very... Um, easier than any other network upgrade or how was it for you? Hmm. Uh, it's interesting because um, as you mentioned, it, it, it can look uh, lighter uh, than others, but it's actually not because you have to play along with other uh, clients. So the whole interoperability angle here was really the challenge. And so most of the issues that we have was, you know, like, how is Bezu running with uh, this consensus client? Uh, all, we were basically looking at all the pairs that we have, uh, Bezu Teku or Bezu Prism, uh, Bezu Lodestar, etc. And so, yeah, the biggest challenge here is testing in a, in a context of interoperability where you do not control or sometimes really know well the other softwares. That is an important point. When we are getting to merge, it is important that interoperability should be considered yeah. in mind. Uh, talking about that, I remember one of the biggest uh, interrupt session of M Forum. So uh, I would like to learn a little bit about the experience in person meeting for launching a testnet or performing a testnet. Do you think it is anyway helpful than doing it asynchronously, living in different part of the world? How was the experience mm -hmm. there? I mean, honestly, uh, and that's why I said, I think we managed to do three months uh, worth of work in one week. So, uh, yeah, 
I mean, maybe if we had more in-person meetings, uh, we've, we would have merged earlier. <laughs> That's a very good point. I'm sure EA will consider that to have more in-person meeting to get things more faster. All right. Uh, uh, I see you have covered most of the point. Um, I have one uh, final question on the client diversity part. Uh, you mentioned client diversity is important and as in the slide, it was obvious like we are able to get it on the CL client, but it is still far on the EL side. What do you think the role of BC could be here? Like you mentioned that we are this is trying to move more towards the Ethereum mainnet than enterprise level. So we'll definitely expect more user to join in. How do you think these can play an important role here? And any features that you would like to mention again that can be useful? Yes. So, I mean, there is a uh, different ways to go about it. First, uh, it's Bezu is a minority client, so the obvious role that Bezu can play here is try to get as much uh, as many users as possible, and that is how we contribute to client diversity as well by communicating more, sharing more about what we are doing, um, you know, just uh, trying to be more present for the community uh, so that they reach out to us, they try the software, and uh, just be there um, to support the people on Discord that are. Uh, going through the steps and the tutorials. So that's one thing. Um, the other thing is increasing our performances. And so that's why we've been doing big uh, strides at that. So uh, Bonsai is obviously a big win uh, for the team. Uh, Snapsing when it's going to be ready is going to be a huge improvement. And so little by little, we're solving uh, most of the bottlenecks that we've been seeing. Uh, there has been lots of uh, tech depth. And uh, I think something that is different for Bezu uh, compared to other clients is that we we started with a very wide scope. And so and so even though we focus now on mainnet, getting reads or just in a clean way, separating the mainnet part from the private permission part is going to be a lot of work because a lot of things are actually uh, connected. Um, so this is what I meant by big engineering challenges. Uh, and so, yes, the other thing is uh, the bounty program that I mentioned. I think if people uh, want to contribute more uh, to Bezu, obviously new ideas are going to come. Um, it's important also to have uh, new, like fresh ideas and fresh pair of eyes on what we're doing. And so that's also how we reach diversity. And this time at the contributors level, as I mentioned, diversity needs to happen at every level. And so if there is only one big company um, developing a software, it's going like, even if Bezu is part of the Hyperledger uh, project, uh, it's currently mainly consensus developing it. So if we really want to reach diversity here, we need to have a lot of organization contributing to Bezu. And so that's something that I would be really happy to see. That is interesting to know. Yes, I think even for client diversity, we don't need to uh, present user getting migrated from one client to another, but we can also engage more new users to join in the network. And when we are having this new features like Bonsai, I'm hopeful that many people will consider running full nodes. Yes, and the fact also that we have Teku um, pretty close uh, in terms of you know many things from a technology standpoint. You know, Teku and Bezu are both Java clients. Uh, they share engineers historically. So the people that uh, were part of the creation of Bezu also uh, were part of the creation of Teku. And so a lot of time when we talk about uh, Beku, so Bezu plus Teku, um, we think about ways we can make the experience easier. Like what about uh, allowing people to just run a combo uh, in a, well, there is no single click, but you get the idea. Um, and so, so yes, trying to just improve the experience uh, and maybe if we reduce the friction, people will use it more. And if they use it more, we'll reach better just decentralization, robustness and diversity. Interesting. Beku is quite interesting. <laughs> I mean, I, I, I don't know, I may have missed it earlier, but this is a great client combination for both like EL and CL. It is highly recommended that if you want to be a part of a, the proof of a stake network, you run both the clients. So if we have a client combination, which are using the same language, exactly. I think it will be easier for the user. 
Um, one more thing I would like to touch before uh, I'll let you leave uh, is about the upcoming test nets and probably in future, like near future about the mainnet forking. Are there any special preparation for Robston or Sepolia test net forking or for mainnet? Yes, um, I think, well, two things. One of your thing is just uh, making sure that we're supporting the, the TTD uh, in the release. So that's that's something that I, I covered. Uh, but the other thing is uh, making sure that we're passing the test. So we're very focused on Hive. Um, so I, I mentioned that, and there is a link in the slide around testing the merge uh, tooling. Um, so yeah, a big... Um, goal that we have is just to pass the test that the community uh, is sharing and we're trying to set the bar quite high and make sure that all client teams are passing that uh, before before moving forward and so this way we know that we're going into this well prepared and we can assess uh, if the robston uh, test network goes well then that's great we move forward uh, and if there are issues we will just uh, fix them and that's that's just how client team's role and uh, when, when it's ready, it's ready and, and then we merge. Right. I mean, I can definitely give the credit here to the client teams for being so patient and running this testing for, I think, about a year now. It started yes. in with Reunism in summer last year, right? Yes. So yes. it's it's I, a really a community effort. It, it was yeah incredible. and. Uh, Marius that I uh, mentioned has been doing lots of uh, work and education around testing the merge uh, with Parry, running the test test nets, uh, doing the fuzzing. Uh, Mikael uh, has been the main architect behind the uh, engine API specification. Uh, so yeah, I just I just feel like there was a lot of very interesting phase and uh, it's a pretty great story. So we just very excited and impatient to get to the merge at this point. <laughs> so, so. I can understand that. Yes, the excitement is there. I, uh, I mean, community is definitely excited with when merge all the time. And we know that even it is for developers because they are bringing this big change to their client team. It is important for them as well. Yes. Well, I think I have a very good news for all the viewers uh, of uh, Peep and Eep channel that we are going to have this uh, information about merge being shared by different client teams. Bezo is the first client that we are having here today, and we are hoping to get more on, on the show. And also we are having Mikhail Kalanin to explain the Indian API and uh, the Paris and Bellatrix and how the transition will actually take place. So... I hope that's, that to be covered soon. That's awesome news. I, I would suggest also having uh, Karim Tam for bonsai trees. Of Pretty course. exciting topic. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, of course. I think bonsai is a very special feature that is added and it is going to help people who are like uh, reluctant to join the network because of the disk space and all. Yes. So yeah, of course, to get some information about this to maybe able to join more users will be useful. Well, thank you. Uh, this is time to wrap up. Anything else you would like to share with our viewers related to client or merge upgrade in general? No, I guess that's it for me. Uh, thanks again very much for having me. Thank you. I hope uh, information shared today is helpful for hobbyists, for enterprise, and even people who are trying to be a part of Ethereum network in future. Uh, and they would be able to join Bezu client. Uh, Thank you, Sajida, for taking out time and talking about Bezo, the execution layer client for Ethereum. On this note, thanks to all our YouTube viewers for watching. I hope this talk helped you learn something new about Bezo. Should you have any question, leave a comment or reach us at eatcatherdis Discord. Check out description for links uh, to useful resources and guest Twitter to follow. We have got more to share with Mud special talk coming up. Stay tuned. Keep sharing your love with Ethereum cat herders. Have a good one, everyone.